OK, so we're going to look at two neat properties of cardioids, so polar curves of the form r equals a times 1 plus cos theta. So the first property we'll look at is that our cardioid has a cusp here at the origin, so the curve comes around and just about touches the origin there. And if we were to draw a chord passing through the origin, so like any of these red lines here, which meet our cardioid at either end, it turns out that all of these chords have the same length, so the length there is constant. And there's quite a nice way of seeing this, just from the definition of our curve. So if we imagine we're trying to calculate the length, let's just say we've got the origin here and we want to have, let's say it's this chord that looks like this here. So we could add in the angle theta going round to the top point on our cardioid, and then we can work out the actual distance from the origin to this point on the cardioid just by using r equals a times 1 plus cos theta. So we just call this r theta. Then you can see we need to go around another half turn to get all the way around to here. So then this distance will be r theta plus pi. So we'd be using the equation, but instead of the angle being theta, it's theta plus pi. So then we can use this now to actually calculate the total length of this line here, so calculate the length of this chord. So substituting in for theta, we just get a times 1 plus cos theta. Then for the other one, we have a times 1 plus cos theta plus pi. Then we can simplify this cos theta plus pi term. We'll actually just quickly derive this using the angle sum formula. So cos theta plus pi is equivalent to cos theta cos pi minus sine theta sine pi. And you can see here that the cos pi is just going to be equal to minus 1, and the sine pi is just going to be equal to 0. So actually the whole thing simplifies then. Cos theta plus pi is just the negative of cos theta. So we can substitute this in now to get that our total length is a times 1 plus cos theta plus a times 1 minus cos theta, just replacing cos theta plus pi by cos theta is negative. Then you can see our a cos theta and our a minus cos theta terms cancel, and we're left with a total length then just of 2a, which is independent of theta. So we've shown then that the length of these chords, whatever our value of theta is, is always going to be constant as long as it passes through this cusp point at the origin. And now our second property of this cardioid is that if again we have any chord passing through this cusp point at the origin, if we look at the tangents to the curve at either end of this chord, it turns out that these two tangents are always perpendicular to each other. So how are we going to derive this? Well, we need to find some nice expression for the gradient of either of these tangents. And this isn't so easy to do with polar coordinates, but it is quite straightforward. We could express this as dy dx if we were to convert back to Cartesian coordinates. And we can use the chain rule, actually, to get an expression for dy dx as dy d theta times d theta dx. Then just taking the reciprocal of d theta dx, we can write this as dy d theta divided by dx d theta. And this is quite nice because we can express y and x quite easily as functions of theta, which will allow us then to find the gradient of the tangent to the curve at these two points eventually. So if we start with finding dy d theta, we know that y is just equal to r sine theta. This will always give us our y coordinate. So we know that r is a times 1 plus cos theta. So this just simplifies to a times 1 plus cos theta multiplied by sine theta. Then we can differentiate this just using the product rule. We get dy d theta is a times minus sine theta times sine theta again, differentiating this first term. Then we also get a times 1 plus cos theta multiplied by the derivative of sine theta is cos theta. So then we can factorise this, take out the factor of a first of all. We've got a minus sine squared, we've got a plus cos squared, and we've also got a plus 1 times cos. So just reordering this slightly, we can write it as cos squared theta minus sine squared theta plus cos theta to give us quite a nice expression for dy d theta in terms of theta. And we can do the same thing for dx d theta. So we know that x is always going to be equal to r times cos theta. This will always give us our x coordinate for a polar curve. And again, replacing r by this a times 1 plus cos theta, which we multiply now by cos theta. 
we can differentiate this again using the product rule to get that dx d theta is a times minus sine theta times cos theta plus a times 1 plus cos theta times the derivative of cos gives us a minus sine theta here. So then we can again collect our like terms. So we can take an a out first of all. We've got a minus sine theta cos theta. We've actually got another minus sine theta cos theta here. So we've got minus 2 times sine theta cos theta. And we've also got just 1 times negative sine theta. So we take away another sine theta. So this gives us quite a nice expression then for dx d theta in terms of theta. So then we know that dy dx, we just need to do dy d theta divided by dx d theta. So then we get a nice expression for dy dx in terms of theta. So you can see when we divide this by this expression, the a's will cancel. So in our numerator, we don't have the a, we're just left with cos squared theta minus sine squared theta plus cos theta. Then in the denominator, again, the a has been cancelled, and we'll take out this negative, so we'll note it as negative in brackets, 2 sine theta cos theta minus sine theta. So this tells us then that dy dx, or the gradient of our tangent to the cardioid at a point theta, is given by this expression. And now we want to find an expression for dy dx, not at theta, but at theta plus pi, so that we can get the gradient of the tangent, not just when it's theta, but at this point, half a turn round at theta plus pi. So here we're going to basically just substitute in, instead of theta, theta plus pi. And it's helpful here to remember that we've already seen cos of theta plus pi is just equivalent to negative cos theta, and you can show similarly that sine of theta plus pi is also just equivalent to negative sine theta. So then when we substitute in theta plus pi here, we just need to replace cos by its negative and also replace sine by its negative. So we can say that dy dx at this point theta plus pi is just going to be, we've got cos squared theta where we replace cos theta by its negative, but actually the two negatives cancel out. So we're left with the numerator is almost the same, cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. Again, the negatives cancel the only difference is we now have minus cos theta instead of plus cos theta. And similarly in the denominator we've got 2 sine theta cos theta actually just stays the same because the two negatives cancel and the only difference is this plus sine theta in the bracket becomes minus sine theta. So then we've got this expression for dy dx at this point theta plus pi and now it's just a matter of the classic way of checking that two lines are perpendicular to each other is to multiply the gradients and see if that's equal to negative 1. So if we find this product dy dx at theta multiplied by dy dx at theta plus pi we just need to multiply each of these fractions together. So to make the calculations a little bit more manageable, we'll just use a shorthand, we'll replace cos theta by c, and we'll replace sine theta by s. So this whole product becomes c squared minus s squared plus c over negative 2sc plus s in brackets. Then we multiply this by the new dy dx is c squared minus s squared minus c over negative 2sc but with a minus s in the bracket in the denominator. And you can see that we've actually got a difference of two squares expression in the numerator with c squared minus x squared as our one term and the c plus or minus as the other. And we've actually got the same thing here because these two negatives cancel out with each other. We've got 2sc plus s and 2sc minus s. So then we can get a slightly nicer expression for the whole thing. c squared minus s squared all squared minus c squared in the numerator, and then using difference of two squares in the denominator, the 2sc term squares to become 4s squared, c squared, and then we just have minus s squared. So now we'll take advantage of the identity that cos squared plus sine squared is always going to be equivalent to 1, and we'll actually get rid of all of our c squared terms. So we know that c squared then can just always be written as 1 minus s squared, so cos theta squared is always 1 minus sine theta squared. So then we can substitute this in and we get in the numerator 1 minus 2 times s squared in the first bracket all squared minus 1 minus s squared. So that's our new numerator and then in the denominator we've got 4s squared times 
1 minus s squared, and again minus just the s squared term there. So now we'll clear some board space and we'll finish simplifying this and hopefully show that this is equal to negative 1. And in the numerator, if we take this 1 minus 2s squared all squared term and expand, we get 1 minus 4s squared plus 4s to the 4, and we've still got minus 1 and plus s squared for our new expanded numerator. And if we expand the bracket in the denominator, we're going to get 4s squared minus 4s to the 4, and still minus s squared. So you can see in the numerator, the 1 and the minus 1 are going to cancel out with each other. And we've also got this minus 4s squared and a plus s squared term, so we end up with minus 3s squared plus 4 s to the 4 as our simplified numerator. And in the denominator we've got the 4s squared but another minus s squared, so we've only got 3s squared and we've got minus 4s to the 4 still. So at this point you can see that the numerator is just the negative of the denominator, so this is indeed equal to negative 1, which is what we were trying to show. So then the product of these two gradients is negative 1, which tells us then that they are perpendicular to each other. So we can conclude that whenever you draw a chord going through this cusp at the origin on a cardioid like this, and you draw the tangent at either end of these chords, those two tangent are indeed perpendicular to each other.